Hi, I'm Mark Crisano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. Today, we're going to go through the OPEC agreement. What does it mean? What are we thinking? Uh, we've been talking about OPEC nonstop, what it feels like for the last couple of weeks. And you know, we're going to cover a little bit on the back end about demand, where we think demand is, but we really cover that weekly in the uh, EIA show, as well as parts of the econ show, as we're looking at kind of that global GDP backdrop. But we'll provide some updates, and then again, we'll go through this in more detail next week. So th this is just, you know, before we really get into it, we just, again, want to remind you, please like, share, subscribe. Uh, we're going to cover some things in here that are going to go a little bit deeper into uh, pet cam and refining. And just as a reminder, we will have our report. Uh, it's coming out next week, looking at the, at the broader, uh, you know, U.S. energy market, which we'll touch on here. And then really, what do we think about liquids? What are we thinking about NGLs and condensate in general? And, and I think it's important to mention it here just because obviously we're going to talk about it as we go through the OPEC plus agreement and what does it mean as we uh, uh, progress into the new year. So just to kick it off, looking at this chart. So this this is my work. These are uh, uh, some of the things that I've been putting together from different things that I read. You might have slightly different numbers, but I mean, for the most part, we'll be in the same uh, ballpark in terms of where things are. So the, the reason why when, when everyone talks about the initial size of the cut, you have to appreciate what is the reference output. And the reference output was when everybody increased production. Russia was was at uh, was at highs. You know, Saudi was at highs. All of these, you know, Iraq was another one. Everyone had run product production higher and then cut from the elevated level. So you have to consider what March 2020 production was, and that's why we're, we're looking at where was the references, what are what did things become, and then what was November production, and then what was the quota in terms of where they should have been. So that November production is really important because November production, if we look at just the, the OPEC countries that were not excluded, so November production was at about 21.9 million barrels. The quota was at 21.8. So just to think about, you know, there was a little bit, you know, we keep talking about cheating, we keep talking about what the cheating looks like. And now the new January cuts is the is including the adjustments. So what did they agree to? They agreed to increase production 500,000 barrels in January. So the expectation was for either something base and or a decline, but they actually increased production by 500,000. Now they were supposed to increase it by 200. Uh, by, I'm sorry, by 2 million. So now we're instead of 2 million, we get 500 with the idea that they're going to meet every month to reassess the way things look, you know, how, you know, where's demand, where's supply, where's storage. But so far, the idea is going to be 500,000 in January, 500,000 in February, 500,000 in March, 500,000 in April. So the 2 million gets spanned over a longer period of time. And how is that broken up? So just to give you an idea, put this into context. So Saudi Arabia and Russia, the two largest members, obviously, are allowed to pump 126,000 barrels a day more based on commentary and documents that you know, we've been seeing. S&P uh, Global Platts agreed with us. And then both Saudi and Russia will now have quotas. If you look now at the January production target, of 9.119 million barrels a day. Now, you can look at, at Russian data. Russia has production over 10 million, but you have to back out condensate because condensate, again, coming back to the liquid side, condensate is not included in the OPEC agreement, which is why Nigeria has been trying to get them to slate about 120, 126,000 barrels as condensate, but again. So now when, when we go back, so then that's the largest. Iraq will be capped at 3.857 million, while the UAE will be at 2.626 million. Now, just to give that backdrop, what does this mean? So non-OPEC can increase 178,000 barrels a day with most of it going to Russia. And OPEC plus can increase 482,000 barrels a day. Now, all of this, this doesn't include Libya. So Libya's has already increased production from, if you look at March, they were producing 100,000 barrels a day. And in November, they produced 1.05, well, 1.50 million. So 
now the January production target, same, nothing changes for them. Venezuela has obviously died because they've gone from uh, 700,000 to 400, so they've lost some there. And Iran has gone from about 1.98 to 1.91. So nothing crazy in terms of the adjustments. So what does it mean as we, as we look forward? All this is doing is legitimizing cheating. And the reason why we say that is because if we look at November production for Russia, it was 9.122. Their quota was 8.99. And now their January production target is 9.119. So clearly they, they're just going to, they can continue doing what they're doing. If we look at Iraq, Iraq was, if you look at November production at 3.86, their January production is 3.857. Again, 3.86 was over their quota. They've been cheating. And now the January production target is essentially right where they've been producing at. So we, then we look at Nigeria, another country that has been cheating. So we look at Nigeria, 1.54. January production target, 1.516. Again, uh, they're getting to this point of where things sit, how things are being accomplished, and they're just legitimizing their cheating that we've been seeing since May. And that's why we, when we look at January, the market could say, look, we've already seen this. We've seen the show. We've, absor we've absorbed I uh, Libya. We've absorbed the cheating. So really, there is no increase in January because everything's going to be held constant. But then when we go into uh, February, that, that the question is going to be, will we see an increase? Because they're going to meet every time to come up with some sort of solution. Now, when we go to the non-OPEC output estimates, now this is from S&P Global Platts. You know, there's not really nothing to say in terms of, you know, where they are because the, the, the numbers have been pretty good from this part. And you can see the Jan cuts and then the, the January adjustments. So total OPEC plus at 34.9. Again, this, this is, we've, we've been in this, in this uh, party for a long time. And the problem that we see going forward well, the, well, let's start with the benefit. So what did Saudi Arabia and Russia accomplish? They were able to hash out an agreement uh, across 23 countries. So this was obviously a, a, a big um, you know, agreement, and they were able to, to get people to come to, to some sort of terms. The problem is, one, the UAE has been saying, look, you, you yelled at me for cheating, and we'll show the numbers overall, and now you're just you're, you're not going to force anyone to cut back, even though the UAE did make up for their, for their over allotment, their overproduction, and others haven't. And now you're just legitimizing. So they knew that if there was no penalty, there was going to be an increase in production anyway, because these, the, the, you know, we're talking about countries that have struggling balance sheets, you know, they're facing, you know, net debt increases. So there's, there's a reason if you're not going to get price, you're going to get volume. And that's what we've been seeing over time is more and more volume coming to, uh, to the market. And now this is just going to allow it to, and, and it's going to be under some sort of guise of unity where they're just going to bring things back on a lockstep. But when we look at the market on the underneath it all, you know, China has started to slow and we'll talk about some of those numbers. India, South Korea started to, to diversify a bit and, and moved away from some of the flow. And the question is going to be how much of this is just sitting uh, on the sidelines because there is a significant amount of uh, spare capacity, which we'll talk about in a second. So just looking at, you know, another source, just because there's always <laughs> varying sources, you know, here, Libya is obviously the biggest increase. The UAE, you know, Venezuela is, is, is going to be um, back and forth depending on, on what the options are. So the real, the real ones to watch is always going to be Nigeria, Libya, and what is happening in, in Iraq in terms of, you know, meeting with the over allotment. And this is just looking at what has been collected. But when we, when we start talking about, well, why is the UAE so angry? Here's just the rice debt production data through November. So as, you, as we go back to 2013, so before we really got this type of uh, battle, if you will, on a price level, you can see where the production numbers sat. So when we look at Saudi Arabia, you can see in 2014, the increase that went from just below 10, right back up to uh, to uh, you know, just just about 11 million barrels, but it's important to understand that Saudi Arabia doesn't have to increase production to you know hit the market with a, with a lot of additional crude because they do have a significant amount of crude in storage around the world, which is how they manage their um uh, their 
you know, their flow, which the UAE has, Kuwait has, you know, we just had a new agreement signed with Japan to, uh, to utilize some more of the, uh, to utilize uh, additional um, uh, tank capacity. But when we look at the increases, and again, this is why we, we always come back to what was actually the cut, you know, when we when we go to the beginning of uh, 2020, you can see Saudi Arabia, Saudi, <clears throat> excuse me, Saudi Arabia had a huge increase in volumes that reached about 11.7, 11.5 million, depending on what it was. Now they claim that's production. You know, we given when we look at what is the spare capacity. We can argue that the spare capacity is anywhere from, you know, let's call it 11.5 to 11.7 to 12.5, depending on whose numbers you're using. But realistically, we have about 10 million barrels a day on the sidelines, as we can see in the OPEC production chart from earlier. So when we look at total capacity across total OPEC, it's about 34 million barrels. Now, there's no way all of that comes back on quickly, you know, right away. Maybe there's about five to seven million of it that is viable. And the reason why we say viable is because, you know, typically to, to claim spare capacity, it's something that turns on in 30 days and can re- and stay on for 60, uh, for 60 to 90 days. So that's why there's, there's always this, this pushback as to what is actual spare capacity. So just based on reported numbers, it's about 10 million barrels based on October production and just under, and, just, and about 9 million barrels based on November production. So this is just OPEC. This isn't including the U.S. This isn't including uh, Russia. This isn't including others because Norway has officially moved out and will not renew the um, the deal. And and that's why when we look at you know coming back to the rice debt production data, you can see that the UAE had a huge drop off, and, and because it's that you know let's call it. Uh, I mean, what's the right the right color for that? The light yellow, that you can see that they had a precipitous drop where the Kuwait didn't really get the same type of drop. You know, obviously Saudi picked up a big chunk of it, but the UAE on on a percentage level was required to make a bigger cut, which is why they they had such anger towards you know why can't they re- they produce more? And here you can see we're slowly grinding higher, even though the we didn't get an adjustment in the cut allowance. You still have Iraq going higher. You have Nigeria moving up, which is why there was this concern about, well, what is what are things going to look like on in the first quarter of 2021? So this is just using some of the estimates, you know, from Bloomberg, OPEC data. So if they were if they were to increase two million barrels in January, the idea is that we would have seen a net increase of about two hundred thousand barrels a day. A 1Q rollover, which just means that there's there's nothing, you know, they they keep the cuts the way they are. There was going to be a draw of 1.7, a taper from February, 1.2, taper from January, about a draw of 700,000 barrels. Again, 700,000 barrels can be made up in a lot of different ways, which is why we're getting very close to a swing of, well, where are the vaccines? Pfizer just cut their expectations for vaccines in half for for uh, the rest of 2020. You know, does that mean that we're going to get additional re- reductions? We've seen lockdowns, we've seen spreads. You know, there's there's obviously issues with COVID in general and just, you know, the health of the global economy. So that's why there's they're going to look at the cuts every every month going forward because if we get a drop di- an additional drop in demand, that that draw of seven hundred thousand barrels could quickly go away. Now the question is, are they actually going to roll back cuts? It's going to be very hard to see that just given how they sit in their uh, in just their health of the underlying uh, economy in, in general. So then when we look at exports, because there's obviously production and then there's exports. So let's look at what are the exports. And you can they, they've been fairly stable coming out of uh, the, you know, the, the, um, the Persian Gulf. But it, you know, there was some weather, which is, is just, a, a, you know, it's transitory. That's not a huge issue. But weather did impact a little bit. You know, the bigger component here is where is Saudi Arabia? You know, how is Saudi Arabia adjusted? And you can see that they've been able to maintain pretty stable exports from January, looking back to January 17. And then obviously you had the, the price war that kicked off and you had the big spike across all of them. But the exports have been fairly stable and it they've clearly turned away from the U.S. Because now when we look at, you know, the exports in, in aggregate, well, where are they going? How are they being directed? Why are we seeing draws in other places, builds in, in others? 
and they're really trying to move around where the crude is going and how they can adjust kind of those those different idea uh, you know the different backdrops of you know who's getting the crude how is it getting into the market and it, it's it's important to just appreciate you know how close we are to to an increase that could really tip the balance of this uh, you know the scale and and we're seeing that in some of the you know the uh, the actual pricing uh, within the physical market and then when we look at <clears throat> crude going, uh, you know, oil exports to to China, you can see that they've backed off a little bit. But when we talk about, you know, how things are moving within Asia as as we go through uh, floating storage, so the flows to South Korea have gone lower in November, dropping by about 45,000 barrels a day and setting a new low in records going back to 2017. And small increases in the shipments from I- Iraq, UAE, <clears throat> We're able to offset some of the slums from Kuwait. So again, it's just a matter of you know who's sending what, where, who's getting into the market, and the Asian, uh, uh, you know, some of the different Asian nations, especially South, South Korea, has been pulling a little bit more from uh, from the U.S., which has helped kind of offset some of the increases that they typically get from from the Persian Gulf overall. And when then when we look at okay, well, India has been edging lower through November, and we're going to see another decline in November, which we we've expected and talked about given some of the issues that we've seen in India. And the question is always going to be what is happening in China. So shipments in November were almost two hundred seventy thousand barrels a day, or eleven percent below t- uh, the year before going into India. So that's why. Even it, even though China's seen an increase, which we've seen, we've talked about, India is starting to slow, which is why we've seen a little bit of an offset, which has been a bit concerning, uh, you know, just in terms of where things are going, and how that is is being achieved, and that's why when we when we look at crude and condensate going into Japan, Japan has seen a lot of growth. So you know, as we you know, October was was a tough month, but you know now November. Is starting to offset that with the UAE up about 416,000 barrels, uh, which is 84%, and are now close to 50,000 barrels above their 2019 average levels. So the UAE is increasing, but at the same time, like I said, when you talk about UAE into Japan, they've also come up with a deal in order to utilize some of that, that, um, that commercial storage. Kuwait has something similar. Saudi Arabia has something. And it's just a matter of moving more crude within the region. So it, 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 does, it makes sense to see Japan increasing. But the U.S. has seen a, <laughs> a massive drop off. So when we look at the imports from the Persian Gulf into the U.S., you can see that there's been a huge drop off. And even though there's been such a huge decline in the U.S., again, coming back to our EIA show, looking at the builds that we've seen over time going into or at least not really drawing as much because we, we did have five hurricanes taking 70,000 barrels out of the market, which has helped pad three storage and even with the loss of the of with the loss of production from the hurricanes we still have near record highs or at least seasonally adjusted record highs in in pad three with cushing you know near the top of that range which is concerning because as we start to see more production coming back you know especially coming from the persian gulf you know there's only so much that can go into china and in our report we go through you know the refiners that are coming online the pet chem that's coming online because not only is China building, but we also have the Middle East that's building refining and pet chem, you know, uh, with uh, Saudi increasing their, their, uh, their exposure by purchasing Sabic, you know, looking to looking downstream and wanting to diversify, because if I can sell oil at 45 or a higher value hydrocarbon, whether it be, uh, you know, uh, a high density polyethylene or gasoline, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make that sale. I'm going to sell it to myself or I'm going to create joint ventures where I'm going to do a deal. You know, Saudi Arabia did a lot with China. Russia has done some with India where they'll, they, there's a long-term contract where these, these jo- joint ventures, they'll agree to purchase crude and or condensate from these countries. And it, it, even though we've seen pressure, this is something where they have a locked in market share. And this is a way to kind of offset some of these losses and some of the concern on demand going forward. But the declines in production, and as we've shown with some of the um, some of the previous charts, it's really coming from the U.S. So they're taking from the U.S. and sending it elsewhere. So as they come back, you know, how much more can we really see some of these uh, individual uh, some of these individual individual company uh, countries take in? 
Now, when we look to Norway, who is letting their cuts expire, you can see that, you know, just in terms of where loading schedules are, they're right back to 20, 2010 highs. And just based on, you know, uh, the Johan um, field coming online, Johan 2 is coming on next year, and they have uh, two additional fields really coming on over the next two years. So in, in total, obviously, jo Johan is one field with the second part coming on next year. And then two more that are coming on that are just kind of aggregates to help offset some of the loss in production. And it's just really keeping production flat. But you were getting back to levels that we haven't seen since 2010 coming out of the uh, Norway with the North Sea really coming into, you know, let's just say 2000, 2010, you know, taking out those 2010 highs once we factor in other areas. So again, these are this so even though we're getting these reductions from OPEC again this is you know let's call it a uh, hundred thousand barrels additional coming from Norway again there was an expectation of the seven hundred thousand barrel a day drop based on the taper but now we're adding back some of this with the U.S. finding some support so then when we look at just where is production overall you know this is looking at Norway you can see the Norway increase you know Nigeria and Angola have have walked back you know, Russia, this is just picking up what's hitting the water, not what's not going through pipe. But Libya is the biggest, you know, shocker. You know, when we look at how much export, how many exports, what was the loading schedule? You can see in August, they were at 78,000 barrels a day. So they were exporting 78,000 barrels a day in August. Now they're moving closer to 1.1 million barrels a day. Libya is excluded. And Libya is excluded up to 1.2 million barrels a day. Now, it, they could let them go to 1.3 just because, obviously, the civil war, all the issues that they've had in terms of cash flow. But this is what we have to look at and consider when we start looking at Libya because you can see the exponential growth where August was the low and then we had a huge increase. And now they're starting to taper in terms of what they can see. Couldn't they get to 1.1? Sure. But it's really going to be hard to get past that over the next couple of months. But this is crude that wasn't that wasn't there not even three months ago. So that's why this is something to look at, something to consider as we go into a very uncertain Q1. And this is some some charts that I thought were great. Uh, I talked about it on Twitter. I, I know Paul Sankey liked it as well. He he was a fan of the peg. Uh, this is just looking at some of the biggest producers, Russia, Saudi, Iraq, and where where's their break even? Again, this is a moving target. You know, you might know you might think Saudi is at 97. You, some people might say it's at 77 based on the cuts. This is just an average. So take it for what it is. It's just a way to 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 talk about their fiscal break even. You know, Russia has said that they 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 plan everything for 45 Brent. Again, you know, it is what it is. But when we look at the key indicators, each one is going to be very important, like Arab light, Basra light, you know, euros, which is why we keep talking about euros, which had a price increase and it started to fall, which is looking at how is the, the physical market actually taking in a lot of this crude. And when we look at Iran, you know, as we go through what is going to happen with, uh, with Biden, will we see some sort of an agreement? Now, I don't think we see it next year at the earliest. I think they're, we're going to wait to, um, for, for their election. You know, when we look at the Iranian economy, the, the Trump, um, President Trump's Sanctions really, really took a bite out of the Iranian economy. Obviously, not only did, did that take a bite, but we've also had pressure in oil prices, which even if even though they're cheating. So when, when you look at Iran, they are able to get around some of the sanctions, but they have to sell their crude at a steep discount. And it's going to be a discount based on posted numbers. So if posted numbers are getting hit, they're selling at a discount. Obviously, there's going to be a steeper discount, which is going to take more money out of the Iranian uh, coffers. And then they had, obviously, uh, you know, they back Hezbollah, they, they back, um, you know, some other, you know, proxy battles within the, the region, which is a drain on capital. So when you look at, you know, the, the, the impacts of COVID, uh, some of the failing uh, proxy battles that they're, that they're facing, these are the issues that are just bleeding capital, which is going to come to light. And you're already seeing the populace turn against the regime. So they're going to be pushed to make some sort of deal with Biden or or, and I think they'll be more agreeable, even though they'll say they won't be. Maybe they try to, to play tough, but there will be something. 
I just don't think it's a, it's a 2021 event, or at least it's not until the very end of 2021 when the new regime or, you know, after the election. So the ones to watch are always going to be the UAE and Iraq because those are the ones that, you know, UAE wants to get back to normal. Iraq wants to get back and Russia refused to cut. They refused to roll the cuts. They were the biggest driver saying, look, the, the market's ready. We need to get back to normal. So that's why this is important. And then obviously currencies are a big deal with uh, Russia being a floating currency versus some of the pegs. Now, you know, why does the, where, where does the UAE get off, you know, getting so angry? And this is just looking at it on a percentage level. And I think, you know, Kemp did a good job of looking at, you know, the UAE, the UAE cuts versus Saudi cuts. And you can see that on a percentage basis, the UAE took a big chunk and have been, have been a big driver of some of the balancing act within the GCC, especially, you know, they had that little pop, you know, let's uh, back in, in September, and then they made up for it uh, aggressively in October. But not only are they annoyed because they did it against Saudi Arabia, but against Russia. So Russia has continued to cheat. And you can see the percentages have been you know, anywhere from, from 7 to, to 12% more than what Russia has been doing, especially as Russia has slowly started to increase in the cheating has, uh, has gotten more aggressive, which is, again, pushing to well, why is the UAE looking to this? And and what we're seeing right now is just the legitimate the legitimacy of cheating. But now, when we look at the U.S., you know, how is the U.S. gonna gonna face this going forward? Because you know, my expectations, our expectations were an exit rate of ten point five to ten point seven. We're shifting that up to ten point seven to ten point nine, just because you know there's a lot of frac spreads coming back, which we'll talk about in our show. But there's also been hedging. So this is just looking at what does the hedge profile look like as of reporting in Q3 and for expected 2021 production. So you can see that there has been a significant amount of hedges that have come out. They've been added in Q3. The third quarter reported, and this is again coming from BNF, uh, third quarter data reported thus far shows firms are looking to expand 2021 hedge books. Uh, you know, they've, they're trying to find ways where the hedges are more puts versus, you know, or, or at least some tor- sort of puts, uh, put spread just because, you know, they want to try to capture as much upside as they can because prices clearly aren't, aren't supportive. But when you want to secure some form of cash flow and some sort of comfort, this is what we're going to look at. And then when we look at 43 re- uh, firms that have reported, uh, earnings have added about 195,000 barrels a day of hedges for next year. So producers are now hedged about 20%, you know, across about 50 companies, about 20% of estimated 2021 production at an average price of 42.16. So clearly 42.16. And now when we look right now, and we're sitting here at, uh, at almost 46, I would expect more uh, hedges to get layered in, which is, you know, this this spike is really allowing a lot of these uh, these increases. And just to give you an idea of, you know, euros and what's happening. So Glencore sells euros at a three month low. And again, so Glencore sells euros in Northwest Europe at lowest price in more than three months. Again, the things that we're looking at to say, okay, well, where is the actual physical market? And this is why I think the U.S. EMPs are are taking this opportunity to go out there and hedges, you know, hedge what they can just to try to solidify what they're going to look like and and what some of their cash flow is, which again is going to carry us through a, a certain part of uh, of the first quarter and the second quarter of 2021. And then when we switch to to gas hedges, you can see that they're you know given how the curve is strengthened, it's normalized a bit. You know, just based on when this was when this uh, picture was taken and where the curve is now. As, as gas has gone from three to 250. So, but the gas centric side, you know, when we look at where things are, uh, producers are now hedged 51% on average at $2.79 in MMBTU. So again, we're seeing those hedges, you know, 20% of 2021 gas production was added in Q3. And again, just trying to, to solidify where things are as we go into the, uh, you know, 2021, which comes back to where are frac spreads going to be. And the more they're hedging, the more, you know, cash flow is understood and, and by understood in terms of locked in, in terms of pricing, if you can get a discount on a frac spread, if you can get a deal on some spot rates, or if you say, look, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to sign up for six months, give me a discount. You, you know, what is that going to look like? And is that going to bring, bring more production back? Which is why 
when we look at, you know, some of the demand functions, here's just looking at congestion across Europe, you know, and just the, the world in general. So China is is back above normal. If you if we think about where things are, they're not back to September levels, you know, and they're starting to roll over again as we go into weather and all the other components. Europe in general has started to recover with Italy, Spain, and and uh, Italy and Spain, uh, Italy, Spain, France adjusting a little bit to their lockdowns. But North America, as things get worse, you're seeing North America really soften. And just given the amount of driving done in North America versus Europe, the decline in North America more than offsets the decline in Europe, uh, the increase in Europe. So just to kind of average out where those gasoline numbers really shake out. But, you know, what does it mean for the U.S.? So, you know, when we look at oil company uh, growth capex, you can see that growth capex has gotten hit. You know, things are starting to get back to a little bit of normalcy in, in 2020. But for the most part, BP, Shell, all of these things are going to remain lackluster. And we really don't get even some semblance of growth until 2022. Again, this could change if oil all of a sudden rallies another $10, then we could start to see some CapEx come back in. But right now, as the curve sits, this is why, you know, when we talk to people who are saying like, look, we're going to get this, this big cycle, we're not getting the investment. You know, our argument is like, look, there's being, there's investment at the NOC level, not so much the IOC level. So that's going to offset some of this growth, this growth shrinkage that is expected in the IOC as the NOCs make up. But some of the NOC ex, um, investments that have, that have already happened have been at the pet chem level. So they're also, you know, looking at and, and hitting more of the downstream, which is where some of these uh, companies are starting to adjust their uh, their portfolios. So then when we look at, you know, what is happening on the NOC level, you know, this is when we start factoring in, okay, well, the IOCs are the ones that are seeing the biggest drop where the NOCs or the national oil companies are starting to see a little bit more of uh, comfort as we've seen out of the, um, you know, the neutral zone in Iraq. And especially being driven by uh, by Russian IOCs, and that's why when we look at okay, well, how are they doing it? What does the leverage look like? And this is just looking at Aramco, which has kind of joined the party, which is why I do like the uh, the title. And it's just looking at the amount of debt that they've issued in order to cover their investments, in order to cover their um, their dividend. And you can see that Rosneft is is obviously at, at the higher end, and BP is everyone has seen some sort of increase which is going to just weigh on future earnings. But at, you know, if you get a recovery in prices, obviously some of this changes, but this just gives you an idea of why there's going to be pressure in some of those numbers. Now, when we look at the U.S., what is happening in the U.S., you know, the, the Alaskan crude continues to have a very strong bid to it. And this is because it is flowing mostly into China. China has been buying uh, the northern exposure, which is why when we talk about the, U, uh, the EIA numbers and, our, and we were a little, um, you know, I should say very off in our expectations for, uh, for crude exports, a lot of it is being driven based on the Alaskan North Slope, which has seen a very strong bid going into uh, China. Now, when we look at some of the data that, that came out today, uh, the non-farm payroll employment, you know, you, this is what we've been talking about. This is why we, we remain concerned. We'll go through this again more in more detail in the economy show. But we're seeing this, this strong, the, you know, the, the growth level off. You know, w- the expectation was for an addition of over 400,000 jobs. We got 245. And it's just inherently slowing and starting to flatten out. As we talked about uh, this in our Wednesday show, looking at the hours worked, you know, companies not coming back. And now when we, when we look to continued claims on regular states, the, you know, the, the decrease that we've been seeing reflects the expiring of eligibility for claims to regular state programs, which is why they're converting into the pandemic side, which is going to be a big part of the omnibus that's being talked about between Pelosi, Schumer, and McConnell. In order to come and bring some sort of uh, of, of of safety to the um, the need for stimulus as an omnibus omnibus deal. So what does that mean? That just means that we have a fiscal cliff on on uh, December 11th, which the government needs more money. If they can't agree to it, the government shuts down. So they're trying to link a fiscal cliff, a new a new spending budget to get us through the end of the year with more stimulus. So now there's an agreement that we're going to get about 900 billion in new stimulus. And this is why, because we still have 
over 13 million people sitting there with getting pandemic unemployment assistance, pandemic emergency assistance, and this is set to expire December 26th. They want to extend this to at least into January to give some leeway. And a, but at the same time, we're getting uh, you know the labor force participation going down. It's back down to 61.5%, again, moving in the wrong direction. And this just looks at that, that pivot that we keep talking about from regular benefits up into the solidified benefits, which is why even though we're getting some reductions in unemployment, it's really not because it's going down. It's just being converted into a different uh, you know, bucket, which again comes down to what does demand look like? How is this going to look going forward? Which is why we remain concerned the overall you know, refined product demand as well as oil demand just given some of these backdrops. And again, the U.S. is, is not unique in this. There's, we can talk about this, and we have talked about this in Europe and Asia, and, and it's just going to be these inherent issues in terms of what is oil demand and what is refined product demand. So, you know, thanks again for watching. I know we covered a lot. There's going to be, uh, you know, more to come as we go through our primary vision for X bread count. So we uh, hope you're having a great weekend. So thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. <laughs>